Elizabeth I is presented by Rakuten, the most rewarding way to shop. Hi, everyone. You're just moments away from listening to the series premiere of Elizabeth I. Before we begin, we want to share with you how this is going to go. Each week, we'll be publishing a new episode for free, available on any platform where you listen to podcasts. That's 10 episodes in total, available every Monday. And for our first week, everyone gets the first two episodes. If you just can't wait for new episodes and want to get early access and an ad-free experience, you can subscribe to the Imperative channel right now on Apple Podcasts. It's your choice. With over 100 hours of content already available on the Imperative channel on Apple, there's a huge slate of shows available right now and a bunch of new series coming out by the end of this year that we think you'll absolutely love. Thank you so much for your support. Now, let's begin our show. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. We are at war with an enemy that knows no sexual, racial, economic, religious, national, or social boundaries. How can we win the war? We must exhibit tenacious courage and boldness in our fight and be willing to pursue diverse and comprehensive approaches. We must continue our spirit of cooperation in our pursuit of a cure, prevention, and treatment of this disease. Over 6,000 scientists and researchers from more than 60 countries are here with one goal, to put an end to the incredible pain and suffering of many thousands and millions in the future. That was Elizabeth Taylor, actress, artist, activist, advocate, mogul, daughter, mother, grandmother, friend, lover, wife, influencer. Yes, influencer. And by today's definition of that term, she was the first. More and more followers of fashion appear to be under the influence of a new breed of opinion maker. And big fashion houses are taking note. When you see a tweet or an Instagram post from one of your favorite celebrities showing off the good life with a cool outfit, a new beauty product, or a beautiful vacation spot. She has more than 5 million Instagram followers and over 15 million subscribers on her three YouTube channels. Even your next door neighbor could be cashing in on the big business of being an influencer. So today I'm going to learn what it takes to become an Instagram influencer. And uh, I'm currently very much not that, so I have a lot to learn. Today, the use of the word influencer has gotten more than out of control. And not only as a buzzword. For young people, influencer culture has become a way of life. And becoming an influencer is the stuff of their dreams. If you are under the age of 30, your parents may have aspired to be a doctor, lawyer, teacher, maybe an astronaut. And these were dreams many achieved. But today, what young people want more than anything is to be famous. In fact, a whopping 87% of kids today say they want to be famous. But is fame and influence the same thing? Unlike the astronaut dreams of their parents' youth, when we look at the numbers of their social media accounts, they might actually be influencers. Fake Famous, the recent documentary about the overwhelming obsession of young people's desire for fame, said that there are 40 million individual accounts on Instagram that have over 1 million followers, and over 100 million accounts with over 100,000 followers. 100 million accounts with more followers than most American mayors. That's power. Add TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and well, influence is a real thing, and it's here to stay. The influencer of today exists in the most powerful medium, social media, via the most influential and accessible media platforms that mankind has ever possessed all on a phone that we have with us 24-7. And on that device, the entire thing is intentionally designed not only to give power to our voices, but to addict each and every user. We just can't stop. On top of all that, 
a young influencer sees hundreds, if not thousands of followers added each and every day. It's not just an influencer way of life, it's a drug. And it burns white hot, instant gratification and instant fame. Just one viral video can do the trick. But outside of the use of the term for social media accounts, are they actually influencers? And what exactly are they influencing? And most importantly, does it even matter? Well, it does. We now know that the tools social media influencers are using, the platforms, are incredibly powerful in and of themselves. They're literally shaping people's minds, especially our young people. So influencers have a unique role now in our society, one that is connected to our overall health, mental, emotional, spiritual health. To wield power as an influencer comes with a tremendous responsibility for those who understand. And although those tools weren't around for the majority of Elizabeth Taylor's life, she knew how to wield her influence. If you view Elizabeth Taylor's life through the frame of the first influencer, there is a playbook to follow. What will we discover as we dive into the extraordinary life of the first influencer? That's the journey we're on. Regardless of how much you may know or remember, you'll hear things you've never heard before. From Elizabeth and from those who shared a part of her life. People she loved, whose lives were personally influenced by her, and both they and the world around them were changed forever. Her influence did not just happen overnight. Elizabeth had longevity. Her power as influencer evolved with the scope of her life. She went from the biggest movie star on the planet to a woman who dealt with loss, sickness, and near death. She was named the most beautiful woman in the world at age 15. She commanded the first million dollar salary as an actor back in 1959. She broke the studio system and owned her own production company. She broke that mold by doing Cleopatra as soon as she had the freedom to pick her own project and Cleopatra changed the studio system forever. She was the first public person to openly enter rehab, destigmatizing addiction and recovery. When she came into the Betty Ford Clinic and made the announcement, their phones were ringing off the hook. They weren't prepared. Even Betty Ford was frustrated because there were, it, they, they couldn't handle it. She was an alcoholic, she was a drug addict, and she was going to get help, and she, that act literally destigmatized rehab. Look at how many people today go to rehab. She paved that, she paved that, she made it okay. Like, if Elizabeth Taylor can be open about her need for help around these issues, everyone else was like, I guess I can too. She wore and owned the world's largest and most valuable private jewelry collection. Today, it still stands as the most important single owner jewelry sale ever to come to auction. Do I ever think we will experience something like that again? I don't think so. I don't think so. There were many world records set that day. She built a business empire that completely transformed the multi-billion dollar fragrance world. She was Elizabeth Taylor, president of the Elizabeth Taylor Beauty Company. And the truth of the matter was, when it came to her brands, we took direction from her. And for all today's young influencers, building their followers through glamour shots, Instagram selfies, and likes, it was the public's unquenchable thirst for Elizabeth Taylor that first created the paparazzi as we know it today. The restaurant was shaking. I mean, the walls were shaking because there were so many paparazzi pushing at the windows. She was fearless like no other. I'll get off in a minute. I'll get off, I have something to say. There's 70, there's 70,000 people in this stadium tonight. Look at yourselves. Look at how many you are. You are the future of our world. You are the best and the brightest 
You are the shining light that will illuminate a better world tomorrow. It isn't just money, fame, and glamour that make Elizabeth Taylor the first influencer. To understand what Elizabeth accomplished to make her the first, we have to complete the definition of what an influencer truly is. Today in social media, or back in the day before teenagers had cell phones, let alone Instagram accounts. Most purely defined, influencers use media platforms to cause an in-real-life action from others. These acts can run the gamut from buying a product to getting out the vote. And in order to cause them, the influencer regularly and intentionally directly engages with their audience. I'd like to express my appreciation for the invitation to speak to you today. I'm honored to be here as the national chairman of the American Foundation for AIDS Research. I must admit that I do not usually welcome the opportunity to speak to members of the media. (laughs) However, it is indeed a privilege to be able to address such an important audience. Like no other profession, you have the power to provide information to conquer ignorance, and to mobilize opinion. I would like to thank you for the important role you have played in the dissemination of information about AIDS to the citizens of our country and the world. Not only is AIDS information imperative in order to save lives, it is also of critical importance in ensuring compassion and dignity to those who are diagnosed. That was Elizabeth addressing the National Press Club in 1987 on the most taboo subject of the time, AIDS. It's not hyperbole to say Elizabeth Taylor influenced a president, a nation, and a world, and focused us all into action over the last century's greatest pandemic. On this day, she was enlisting her longtime nemesis to join her in the battle. She was asking the media for help. Recently, I was told about a young man who was diagnosed with AIDS and had decided to travel home to visit his parents in a small town of about 3,000 people in Wisconsin. He was understandably concerned about how his family would react to physical closeness. Much to his surprise and elation, his visit focused on love and the caring that he so needed, and not of fear of the contagion. His family already knew there was no risk of catching the disease from their son. Their knowledge came from watching television and reading the newspapers, and that's thanks to you. AIDS is more than statistics. AIDS is prolonged physical and mental torment for many thousands of human beings. It is heart-rending confusion and despair. It is the confrontation of one's mortality, most often in the prime of life. It is the experience of hope that is often shattered and renewed, only to be shattered again. It is shame and guilt which results in living a life of rejection, isolation, and deception. AIDS is fear, devastating fear. Fear of death, fear of suffering, fear of the pain that will be experienced by loved ones left behind, fear of being found out, and fear of bearing the brunt of the senseless stigma of AIDS discrimination and blame, fear that destroys reason, fear that destroys close personal relationships at a time when relationships are most needed. What you just heard from Elizabeth was a critical moment in the global AIDS crisis, and her voice shattered the silence and willful negligence during an era of historical human suffering. How did she do this? What does it take for a lone individual to be able to step into a moment 
and transform both the narratives and inaction of a global population, political leaders, and cultural standard bearers. Who, what kind of person can influence the most powerful people and institutions on the planet to change the world? I'm Katy Perry, and Elizabeth Taylor has fascinated, inspired, and influenced me. As an artist, a woman, an advocate, she was, and still is, a rock star. I'll be at your side through this 10-episode series on a journey that goes straight to the heart. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth I. This is Chapter One, Becoming Elizabeth Taylor. This is Elizabeth Taylor singing Chitty Bitty Bin. That was Elizabeth at age eight. The audio you're hearing is one of her earliest known recordings, never shared with the public, and it gives us the earliest sense of her spirit and artistry. She was born in England in 1932. We had a house in London, and my father was a very prosperous uh, art dealer, had a wonderful gallery on Old Bond Street, and we had a lovely house in... uh, Hampstead. So it was like being in the country, although you were in the heart of London. And then we had a country home that was on my uh, godfather's estate in Kent. And I rode bareback. That was my favorite. And I just took off. And my parents trusted me enough. I was a very good rider. And I'd go riding around the property around all the lakes that were in that area, Kent. My name is Tim Mendelson, and I am a trustee for Elizabeth Taylor's estate, where I'm also an officer of the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. And we work on the brand and the storytelling and the archive. This is all Elizabeth Taylor world. It's a very big world. I mean, her story is just so epic with so many twists and turns. There's just this incredible amount of story there. Because unlike a lot of other kind of iconic people on her level, Elvis Presley or Judy Garland or Princess Diana or Marilyn, uh, you know, they didn't live long lives. And Elizabeth lived a complete life. So she was able to have every stage of it. And she has a huge family, you know, who I know really well from all my years of working for her directly. I still work for her. And I mean, that's definitely how I consider my job. She had eight marriages. Those are all chapters. It doesn't define her life, but it does, it does break it up into parts. I mean, her mother explained to her when she was a little girl. I mean, Elizabeth told me this. She said, you're a nice looking girl. You have lovely eyes, but it's what's behind the eyes. It's what's in your heart that's going to make you truly beautiful. And Elizabeth was a stunning little girl. In England, the Taylors worked among London's high society set. From artists to members of parliament, they were clients and friends. In 1939, with a world war at hand, Elizabeth's parents, Francis and Sarah, returned to the States on the advice of Prime Minister Chamberlain. Initially, they landed on Sarah's family farm in Pasadena, California. What we know about Elizabeth's earliest years comes from both the memories that she shared as an adult 
and the childhood items she left behind, some in her own impeccable handwriting. All of it's preserved in the Elizabeth Taylor Archive. So I'm Mitch Erzinger, and I'm the archivist for uh, the Elizabeth Taylor Archive and House of Taylor. I started it there in 2015, and I was brought in by uh, Charlie Shipes. He put together a team to start working on cataloging and digitizing their collection of photographs. And we worked on that for the better part of a year. And once we started winding that down, um, getting close to 10,000 photographs digitized and individually cataloged in our database, we started to look at expanding it, expanding the scope to the papers, the personal papers, which ended up including over 600 bankers boxes uh, in <laughs> storage that we're still going through. And we haven't even gotten into touching on the personal effects, things like the thousands of, of books that she had in her collection, the over 60 full rolling racks of uh, wardrobe items, fashion. Elizabeth had a huge life uh, in every sense, and that is reflected <laughs> in the archive and what we have. The papers include correspondence going back to her childhood. Uh, her mother kept things. I mean, we, we always say like her mother was almost like her first archivist because thanks to her, we have all of these gems from her childhood that we wouldn't have had otherwise, like um, little drawings that she would draw and give to her, her mother, or little notes and Valentine's Day cards that she would give to her parents or her brother to essays that she wrote as a student at the MGM school. When I look at some of these letters and notes that she wrote to, to her mother, for example, there's this um, sense of honesty and respect that was a little surprising to see so, so early on that apologizing for uh, going to bed 10 minutes later than you know, mother had had suggested or had her had asked her to because she she needed to wash her her face or just these profound expressions uh, of love that oh mommy and daddy dear I I love you so so much with all my heart um, just so darling and and full of love at such an early age. After fleeing England for the outskirts of Los Angeles, Francis Taylor needed to establish himself. For an art dealer of his caliber, there was only one place that paralleled Bond Street in London. Elizabeth's father opened a gallery in the historic Beverly Hills Hotel, and the Taylors settled in Beverly Hills. It was there, in the playground of Hollywood's most powerful, that Sarah's daughter with the violet eyes, charming accent, and impeccable manners caught everyone's attention. My name is Jill Sherry Robinson. And I'm um, delighted to talk to you about one of my most favorite people in the whole world, Elizabeth Taylor, and the unique fortitude and honor of her character. She was a rare and magnificent person. And I love telling these Hollywood stories. She's not a Hollywood story. She's a, it's a story of a great consequential woman, you know, a really magnetic presence that gave something special to every film she made and to every room she walked in. Everywhere, she was the immediate center of the room. And without any sort of awareness, she wasn't conscious, I am Elizabeth and I am here. She was, I'm just this beautiful work of art. It was a different thing. It was a different thing. She was particularly special because, first of all, she was so astonishingly beautiful. I mean, nobody had those eyes. They were like translucent royal blue and just exquisite. And she was, she was really sweet. Yes, Elizabeth was beautiful, a striking child. But it was something else within her that captured people's attention. She was unique, a little British girl, who had the intellect and fortitude to hold her own with adults. And the Taylor's clients at the gallery could not help but suggest to Sarah that she should take her daughter on auditions. Elizabeth was clearly a star. She was a star. She was in charge. She was not a little girl. Some of the others, you know, were little girls. And, and she didn't get preyed upon. 
by bullies and stuff, or people who were jealous, because they knew that there was just no, you know, she was like Queen Elizabeth. And in those days, this was the time when Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret Rose were the thing that everybody was talking about. And so Elizabeth was our queen, our little queen, and it was really cool. Before marrying Elizabeth's father, Sarah was an actress on Broadway. She used the stage name Sarah Southern and continued to go by it for the rest of her life. But perhaps because she was an actress, Sarah was initially hesitant to take the advice of their new social set and parade Elizabeth through an audition circuit. Then war broke out all over Europe. A return to England was unthinkable. Sarah considered the idea that acting could help her special, unique child find a place of her own in her new homeland. The door opened serendipitously thanks to a friend of Elizabeth's father. My father was an air raid warden, and Sam Marks, who was a fellow air air raid warden on the next block, and there was a part for a little English girl, and naturally they had started at the beginning, and she was that high. And at the end of the film, she was that high. So they desperately had to find a child, an English child, that was, you know, the right height. And I fell into that category. Sarah took her daughter onto her first studio lot. It's unclear if either one, mother or daughter, had any idea the world that they were about to step into. By the 1930s, Hollywood, the cultural and economic son of the entertainment universe, had grown into a multi-billion dollar American industry. Entertainment was a titan in a transforming economy. The industrial age of steel and textile dominance gave way to a modern era of services and consumer products, like movies. It was a golden age of cinema, and film studios were the planets that orbited the sun. Paramount, RKO, Fox, Warner Brothers, and Lowe's Incorporated which owned the crown jewel of them all, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, MGM. MGM was founded and run by the infamous entertainment mogul, L.B. Mayer. In this world, he was Zeus. He was a colorful, sullen, but also magnetic presence. He had to be in charge of everything. It was his studio. And Dad went to work for him for a while. And they got along really well because they loved reading and they loved literature. I don't think L.B. Mayer read a lot of books, maybe, ever. And there, there was a sense throughout it. There was, they were like, it was like a miniature United States, Hollywood, where everybody had their own country, you know, their own territory. And that was theirs. And God help you if you were going to have a premiere at somebody else's favorite theater. You know, that wouldn't work. And it was, it was so organized and so, it was so real and it felt like we were the capital of everything. It felt, it felt like everybody knew about it. And we also knew that the only street that we'd like to drive on was Sunset Boulevard. The magic came from what is known as the studio system, where actors were property and executives were gods. When L.B. Mayer put Elizabeth Taylor under a seven-year contract in 1943, she was his. She belonged literally to his studio, and she was only 11 years old. Her life was at the studio. Her school was at the studio, so she didn't have your typical childhood or adolescence where you go to school and you hang out with your friends, you go out and you play. Um, She was working at the studio. She was going to school at the studio. She made friends there, of course, but outside of that world, um, I guess it was very insular. My father, Dory Sherry, was the only writer to ever run a studio, which was a remarkable achievement. Yes, and he he loved it, and he did not regard anyone as merchandise. He knew that these were artists that he was working with. And it was MGM Studio, and I was so glad when he told me. I remember when I was little, 
And he came home at some point and he said, well, I've changed the studio, he was telling my mother, and it's now going to be MGM that I'll be working for. And Jill will be really happy because she loves lions. And I said, well, maybe you could get me a lion. And he got me a stuffed lion. Dory Sherry ran MGM's film department for L.B. Mayer. His daughter, Jill, was one of Elizabeth's first friends. I think I met her when I was in the wardrobe department because I wanted to be a costume designer for the theater. And so after school, I would get our governess to drop me off at the studio. And my father would always find out that I was there. And I was always wearing costumes. And I think the first time I met her, that it was a Western movie, Cowboy, and, she, and it was lavender, and it had bugle bead fringes, and it was just divine. And so after they finished the shoot and everything, they let me have the costume. And I was wearing it, and Elizabeth liked it very much. She said, that's really great. And I said, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you like it. And it, was, it made me feel, yeah, I could do that. You know, it was, she didn't, she knew who she should pay attention to a little. And because my dad was a big deal at the studio at that time, and he was gentle, and the stars loved him because he didn't treat them like merchandise. People were scared. Nobody got away with anything. And they had, that were almost like, not nursery schools, but little schools for the kids. Mostly we didn't play with kids from other studios. And then there was a lot of class system there L.B. would be particularly vicious and crazy and bossy with the stars. And my father, I always knew when Dad had had a war with L.B. Mayer because we'd be home from school and he'd come home early and he'd run upstairs and throw up. My dad was often sick. I mean, literally, L.B. made him sick to his stomach. Jill's father may have known in his heart that the actors under contract at MGM were artists, not products. But on paper they were owned. Their lives were completely controlled by the studio, especially child actors like Elizabeth. The actors, the talent was chattel back then. They didn't have rights. The studio took over their lives. Tim Mendelson worked with Elizabeth as her executive secretary for over 20 years. Elizabeth chose the secretary title not to designate an old-fashioned assistant, but to signify the role of a chief executive's cabinet. She was once married to the former secretary of the Navy, after all. Despite the formality of Tim's position, their relationship was much closer than the job title indicates. Tim was a close confidant and dear friend of Elizabeth's. And what they shared and navigated together was both the public's experience and the -the behind-the-curtain life of the biggest star in the world. I'm never going to feel like she's not here and I'd better be doing the right thing. And I wouldn't even be talking about her except that she's not here to talk for herself. Because when she was alive, she did not want people to speak for her. But she's not here now to speak for herself. Being as close to her as I was, like, I have to do that. And I, I, I get that. And I'm not uncomfortable with it anymore. But it was a hard decision to make to start to talk. Uh, in my formative years, I was very much dominated by my family. Her mother was very controlling, and it's not a surprise that she had probably one of the biggest stage mothers of all time. I mean, her mother was with her always, every day. She she was paid by the studio to watch Elizabeth and take care of Elizabeth and bring her to the set every day, bring her to the studio every day and take her home every day and watch her virginity. I mean, that was Sarah, I'm sure. And not, I don't know if the studio said that that had to be done, but Sarah watched her like a hawk. She was absolutely a virgin when she got married. But through all of this, Elizabeth is learning her value. In many cases, Most of the executives uh, treated stars like merchandise. They were the contract players. She was special. She was, she knew she was special. There was no question about that. In LA, in those days, if you were British, you got a whole different treatment. The other stars were mostly young girls, you know, from like regular schools and all that sort of stuff. And they didn't have the little boys. They didn't have the elegance of the voice. And she had an assurance within her that only people who are really great stars have. 
and she she had this this pride. My father used to. We had a projection room, and then my father would say, "No, no, no motor, no motor, nothing, not interesting." And I was grateful that none of them were ever there to hear that. But when she came, you know, she had that regal auteur. That was that was it. And she had it all the time. She could hold an audience. She could hold anything. And people loved her. And yet, she didn't disappear within herself. She knew she was beautiful, and it didn't embarrass her. It didn't. The difference between Elizabeth and everybody else is everybody else would be embarrassed or uncomfortable about them being different, because kids don't want to be different. She knew she was different, and it was very special. And she knew that she had command, and she could do. She could turn it on, but she could turn it off. She she really didn't want to,、um, you know. She wasn't a kid that you'd say, "Come over and let's go bike riding" or something. She was she was a different kind of animal, and she was、um, she didn't circulate with. The particular kids that I circulated with, because she was always working. There wasn't a time that she wasn't being fitted, or working on something, or helping someone she cared for, another star or someone, to be not frightened about what was going on, or to really study another way of maybe saying a line that she didn't like. I think Elizabeth had so much confidence. And an interior sense of glamour. She didn't have to be, you know, she'd be made up, but she didn't have to be made up. She really just had it, and the accent was a big part of it, and the fact that she had the name of the Queen of England, or the person who was going to be the Queen of England, and that was a big deal. And she, she kind of got along with Shirley Temple, but not much because Shirley wasn't interesting to talk to. Elizabeth's presence and talent soon landed the film roles that exposed her to audiences across America. Beverly Hills was right; Elizabeth was a star. As a child actor, she now had her own money. Her parents managed it for her, but she had an allowance to spend on her own, and that is how two of Elizabeth's most special traits were first expressed: her generous spirit and her love of jewelry. As those letters and little notes from the archive show us, Elizabeth loved her parents. She wanted to do something special for her mother on Mother's Day. So, Elizabeth's father had an art gallery at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and Elizabeth would hang out there sometimes. You know, after she got home from the studio, she'd already made National Velvet, and she liked to. Peek into the stores and see. And one day, she saw this brooch that she fell in love with, and she wanted to buy it for her mother. And so, she got twenty-five cents a, a week allowance. When she went in to, to 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 look at the brooch, she talked to the salesperson, and she said, "I want to get this for my mother, but I don't have the money yet. Can I pay it on layaway, little by little? Because I got to get this for my mom." And when Elizabeth told this story decades later, she had that little girl-like quality of how excited she was to still to buy this brooch for her mom, even after her mom had passed. You know, it was just this innocent, childlike need to do something great for somebody and something with so much love. And so the lady of the store said, "Okay, I will hold this for you, and I will let you pay it as." You can. I won't sell it to anyone else. And as a matter of fact, I'll take it out of the window. And so Elizabeth went on and managed to save the money, which was twenty-five dollars. She was so proud of herself, and she bought it for her mom. And they wrapped it up. And she actually she went to her dad's art gallery and said, "Dad, I, this is a surprise." But she kept it a secret. And you know, she didn't want it. She wanted it to be a surprise. She didn't want anyone to know. So it was like something she could hold within herself for a period of time to just feel the excitement of of doing this. And so she brought it to her mom. Her mom was obviously thrilled. And when Sarah Elizabeth's mom died, she left it back to Elizabeth. 
and we sold it. It so it cost $25 originally. It was sold in Elizabeth's jewelry auction at Christie's in 2011 for $75,000. That was her first time negotiating a deal, and it was her first jewelry purchase. And it was a gift for her mom. That story illustrates yet another unique characteristic of our first influencer. Elizabeth had a mind for business. She could cut a deal. But it was her acting, her artistry, that would actually pave the way for her eventual success as a businesswoman. Through her career as an artist, she would learn how to harness herself as a commodity. And just like the influencers of today, the journey for learning that meant she would first have to build her following. Lassie was one of her first big pictures, and the budget was $400,000. The picture made $4 million, which was, in those days was a very, very big deal, and it was all because of Elizabeth. I mean, Lassie was adorable, too, but she was just phenomenal. The success of Lassie was a breakout moment for Elizabeth at MGM, and it helped position her at the studio for a star-making role. National Velvet. It, it was like magic. I could live out every young girl's fantasy. You know, playing with dogs, uh, doing National Velvet was my life. Pounder Berman, the producer, called me into his office. And I was always a very small child. And he said, Elizabeth, you're just too small. And he said, I'm going to measure you on my wall. And he said, if you can grow three inches, the role is yours. I said, all right, Mr. Berman. I'll be back in three months. And I came back in three months, and I had grown three inches. I willed myself to grow. I'm very, a very determined person. <laughs> I think that's why I'm still alive. I chose the horse, which was a real, in real life, a total renegade. And I tamed him. And the studio bought him uh, on my recommendation because nobody else could ride him. And at the end of the film, they gave him to me. When she was younger, her real independence came from riding horses. That was her time where no one was watching her or controlling her, and she could ride free, and she had this incredible connection with animals. I mean, she was respectful to them, and she loved them, and she took care of them. And so that was her only real freedom when she was, a little, when she was young. Uh, I loved riding on I loved being introspective. I, I love the fantasy world that I was thrown into, and I could separate it from reality. That's probably why I rode so much. I, I would get away, and it was me and the animal, and I'd commute with nature, and that way I could hold onto myself. Elizabeth's love of family and of her horses was never more apparent than when she wrote this school essay in 1948 at the age of 16. I love my parents because they're the kindest, most wonderful parents a girl could have. We do everything together as a family should. They hardly go anywhere without my brother and me. You should see the funny sight we make when we go horseback riding or bicycling, all four of us, with the three dogs happily yipping and yiping close behind. And I'm so lucky that both Mommy and Daddy love animals and all my pets as much as I do. Even as a child, Elizabeth had the ability to clearly express herself, what she loved, her passions. At this age, it was family, horses, and all animals. The girl from the English countryside simply loved the natural world. Although still that girl in spirit, Elizabeth was now gaining fame and making serious money for the studio. MGM would renew and up her contract two more times, 
in 1946, and later in 1952. L.B. Mayer made sure he maintained complete control over the girl becoming his biggest star. As a child, Elizabeth didn't much notice or care. National Velvet and Lassie had brought her joy. But life changed after National Velvet for Elizabeth, not only because she was now one of MGM's biggest stars, but because she was changing. Time, that singular force of nature that none of us can stop. The little girl with more fortitude and composure than most adults was growing up. Elizabeth I is presented by Rakuten, the most rewarding way to shop. Shop through Rakuten for everyday essentials and big ticket items alike. Clothing and shoes, toys and games, electronics, travel and kitchen or home essentials. Rakuten is the smartest and most rewarding way to shop and save. You can earn cash back at over 3,500 stores. Here's the best part. Membership is free and it's easy to sign up. Rakuten deposits your cash back directly into your PayPal account or they can send you a check. It's absolutely a no-brainer. You earn cash back for what you were already shopping for. So start all of your shopping at Rakuten. Your cash back really does add up. Rakuten has 15 million members who are already saving. Get the free Rakuten app and download the free browser extension to make it even easier to save. Rakuten also finds you the best deals, sales, and coupons. Head to Rakuten.com now or download the Rakuten app to start saving today. Her breakout role, National Velvet, she was 12 years old, and then she kind of had a growth spurt, and then she was in this sort of strange period where they, the studio didn't really know what to do with her because she wasn't really a child actress anymore. She was kind of growing up in that weird period between like childhood and adolescence. And so she actually didn't do a film after that for like a year and a half. She did a, a book with the studio called Nibbles and Me. And she did all the drawings for, um, so she's a great artist, in fact. And there are even a couple letters that she wrote to her publisher that are, are very cute, asking for a little more time and uh, perhaps like adding in an extra chapter um, to really flesh out the story uh, a little bit more. So. Clearly, there was already this, this artistic sensibility and level of exercising control. And I think that also comes a little bit in part, not just from the experience at the studio and dealing with all these adults, um, but also with her parents and growing up with them in a kind of, I wouldn't say maybe quite high society, but due to her father Francis's work as a, a gallery owner and an art dealer, you know, a lot of, he would host a lot of more high profile clients or buyers that were coming in to buy art. And they hosted, the family hosted a lot of dinners and parties. And as part of that, you know, Elizabeth was expected to play the, also part of a gracious host and, and help out. And so I think she did learn how to deal with adults at a young age as well. For all of the adults in Elizabeth's life, guiding her, directing her, encouraging, and interacting with her. There was one who had yet to encounter her fortitude. It would leave a mark. She learned her value when she was a girl, when she and her mother went to meet with Louis B. Mayer in his office. And my mother went up to L.B.'s office and said, Mr. Mayer, we read that Elizabeth is supposed to do uh, a musical where well, she's not a singer and a dancer, should she start taking lessons? And he said, are you trying to teach me how to run my effing studio? And he was screaming at her mother using all kinds of curse words. These are words Elizabeth had never heard before. She was a sheltered little girl. I mean, she grew up in England with nannies and, you know, in this idyllic life. They basically were living in Beverly Hills at this point, and she didn't hear those kinds of swear words. And thumbs started forming around the edges of his mouth, 
And he used words, I promise you, up until then, I had never heard. It's since become one of my favorite parts of my vocabulary, but it broadened my vocabulary. And now I just, it reels off and I don't even take the words seriously. I don't swear in anger. Uh, I swear in fun. But the man was not swearing in fun. He was swearing in a fit of rage. And she was 15 years old. And she basically stood up and told him that he could not talk to her mother that way. I said, Mr. Mayor, unless you apologize to my mother right now, I am leaving the studio, I am leaving your office, and I am never going to come back in. Because I would love to go to school, I would like to go to proms, I'd like to go to basketball games, football games, I'd love to go to school with children my own age. I don't give a damn whether I ever act another day in my life. And I'm never coming back in here again. Goodbye. I imagine he kept going and she said, you know what? If you don't stop, I'm not gonna set foot in your office again. And you and your studio can go straight to hell. And I left and of course then I started to break into tears. And my mother stayed behind praying. She was upset. She was being herself. That's how she felt. And she had to defend her mother and fuck the studio. And she ran out of his office and uh, in the reception, he had a secretary named Dick Hanley, Richard Hanley. And she flew into his arms and he held her while she sobbed. And I was told by Benny Thaw, one of the vice presidents, Eddie Mannix, one of the vice presidents, that I had to go back in and apologize or I would be fired. And I said, it's all right with me. I don't mind. There are things I would much rather do than act. And my mother was in there for eons. And I said, he must apologize to my mother before I go back in, which he never did. And I never went back into his office. And I learned a rather cynical lesson because I didn't get fired the next day. And I realized that I must have some kind of intrinsic monetary value to them. Otherwise, I would have been out on my fanny. But the point of it is that she said that this is when she became cynical. This is when she realized, because they didn't fire her, she thought she'd get fired. I mean, obviously, you can't tell Louis B. Mayer was the most powerful man in Hollywood. She's a 15-year-old girl, and she's telling him that he and his studio can go straight to hell and assume she would get fired. When she didn't get fired, she said it didn't make her feel important. It made her feel like shit, because she realized she was nothing but a commodity to them. It was only about money. They didn't give it, they didn't care about Elizabeth. They cared about making money. They needed me. Power, the girl who at age 12 tamed a 1200 pound wild thoroughbred had her first encounter with raw power. Elby couldn't let Elizabeth go, but he would lose the only thing that mattered to him if he did, money. She was his money. Elizabeth came up against a titan, Zeus. She went toe-to-toe -to -toe with that monster, called out his abuse, stood her ground, and got the lesson of a lifetime. The raw power she confronted in that moment was not his. It was hers. Elizabeth walked away from that experience unscathed and forever changed. In her relationship with the studio, she may have had as much power as L.B. Mayer, but power is not the same thing as control. Her influence over L.B. Mayer stopped at the terms of her contract. It crashed into a ceiling of an industry run by men and controlled by the rules that they had created. They owned her. She hadn't known it before, but she knew it then. Elizabeth was a commodity. 
No actor, man or woman, had found their way out of a studio's control before other than to quit. That was the only route to freedom. Elizabeth Taylor would find another way. She would become the first to not only break free, but walk away owning her life, her art, her future, and even a piece of the studio's pie. It would be the first step for the first influencer into a moment that would launch an empire and ultimately change the world. On the next episode of Elizabeth the First. And I came down, I was standing behind my dad. And he said, Jill, you go right back to bed, and Marty's going to be okay. I'm going to take care of it. It was all manufactured by the studio. I mean, her whole first marriage was a big publicity stunt. If you turn down a script, they put you on suspension. If you became pregnant, they put you on suspension. And that didn't set well with me at all. She knew she was the matriarch. This was a role she took on happily. Her voice changed talking about Mike Todd. I thought, he's her guy, he's her person. They were so in love. It was this whirlwind romance on an epic scale. And she has a six month old infant, two sons, and she's making Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And she has to get through this somehow. She's in her 20s. It was horrible for everyone. Elizabeth I is produced by Imperative Entertainment in association with House of Taylor and Kitty Purry Productions. Executive producers are Katy Perry, Jason Hoke, and Stephanie Koff. Elizabeth I is narrated by Katy Perry, produced by Jason Hoke, and written by Stephanie Koff. Sound engineering and audio editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. House of Taylor trustees are Quinn Tivy, Tim Mendelson, and Barbara Berkowitz. And its brand strategy consultant is Aaron Dawkins. Marshall Eskowitz and Kerry Schwartz of Sunset Boulevard serve as producing partners and represent House of Taylor for Elizabeth Taylor licensing and content opportunities. Joshua Klebe wrote and composed the original score. Additional music provided by Reese Tivy. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. If you'd like to support the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, visit elizabethtaylor-aidsfoundation.org. And if you'd like to go deeper into the world of Elizabeth Taylor, keep an eye out for the first authorized biography about her life. Elizabeth Taylor, The Grit and Glamour of an Icon, by number one New York Times bestselling author Kate Anderson Brower, will be out on December 6. For more behind the scenes content, follow at Elizabeth Taylor, at Katy Perry, and at Imperative Podcasts on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Love the series? Don't forget to tell your friends and leave a review. Thanks for listening.